how does looking for perfection in your photography affect the way that you photograph? I, I think one way to think about it is that um, often the perfectly posed, the perfectly composed picture feels a little manufactured. And often the frame afterwards, the frame mm. between the frame, has that reality and that messiness, that slight uh, gesture that wasn't controlled, um, that feels truer. I'm excited for today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about embracing imperfection. I got John Dolan here with me, and um, this is just, uh, I think this is going to be a really fun conversation. I love imperfection and just not, I like, I grew up super perfectionist. Uh, oh. So this will, this will be, this will be fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did you learn uh, to let go? I learned to let go. Yes. I am still, I would say a recovering perfectionist, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I have, I have learned to let go and I've seen the beauty in imperfection and letting go of perfection. Uh, it's tough, but yeah, it's a it, tough process. Yeah, it really is. Um, but I was never yeah. a perfectionist, so it was easier for no. me. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, it's cool. <laughs> I never wanted to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I know some perfectionists. And yeah. Yeah. Are you a firstborn or middle I, child or where are you? I am the, uh, I used to call myself the only youngest child. I'm the youngest of six. Okay. Uh, six so and eight years. Your... So. Yeah. 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 So it felt sort of like I was my own little special island, little caboose at the end of a long train. But, uh, yep. and I never really knew how many people were in my house. I could go to sleep at night counting siblings just, <laughs> yeah. instead of sheep. There, yeah. There might be five here. There might only be three. Who knows? <laughs> there are always people yeah. sleeping over. So, yeah. Yeah. My, my mom is the youngest of six. And it was the same sort of thing where, like, the other five were like 16, 14, eight years older than her. And then she was just like this almost an only child after a few yeah. years. And, yeah. and also the baby that was just like all the other kids, you get to help raise this one. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah. there's no chance for perfectionism in a house like that. It's just not no. even an option. Absolutely so. not. No, no. I grew up, it was just um, myself and my brother who was two years younger than me. And, um, it was, it, we were also homeschooled and moved around a lot. So it was like the four of us just in our bubble moving around the world, um, hmm. or rather just Texas, but, uh, but yeah, it, <laughs> the it world formed, of Texas. <laughs> yeah, the world, I mean, it is big enough, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I definitely grew that perfectionism, like firstborn want to, you know, people please and all of that. And, right. uh, yeah, it, uh, it took hold of me hard until like my mid twenties when I finally like slowed down a bit and started asking myself, like, who am I really? And mm. what do I want to do? And do I want to keep pleasing all of these people that maybe are, I, I don't need to, but you know what? It's really, it is part of, uh, the, journey as a photographer, as an artist to deal with this stuff, because, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been in rooms full of photographers and asked the question, how many are people pleasers? And it's, you know, 80%, 90%. Mm. And it's hard to do both. Um, it's hard to be, to please yourself and to be a people pleaser. But if you're always trying yeah. to please the client, you're, 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 you're toast. You're going to be chasing the tail. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause that, I mean, they're, that changes so often too, that they don't even know what they want. And then, uh, you're trying well, to how please sh them. How would they know, you know, they're, it's their first time getting married and they're insecure and they're reading too mm. many things. And, uh, Oh yeah. You know, I think it's, I think a lot of people look to the photographer for a certain expertise and, and even if you've done 10 weddings, you have more expertise than the person getting married. So you have oh, to exactly. feel kind of confidence and share that. It's part of yeah. your role. 
Yeah. I think that's what took me a while was realizing that I had expertise over the couples and yeah. that they were actually looking to me, even if they didn't say it out loud, they were still looking to me for direction and for, uh, just, uh, my, uh, opinion on different things of like forming timelines and all of that. Yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah, I should probably also give input <laughs> instead of just like, Oh, your ceremony is at five. Cool. I will show up. I don't know. Two. And, uh, yeah, just yeah I, think I, I think it's a mistake that a lot of people make that they, that the, they think that people will like them more if they please them. Yeah. And it's, it's the opposite. It's, it's, you can be protective and you can be additive rather than subtractive and, and bring something to the table. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I always say I felt like a very just kind of plain vanilla person for right. the longest time. I didn't really know what I liked as a person and what I wanted because I was always just kind of form fitting into different scenarios with other people. And, right. uh, and then that just kind of left, like there wasn't anything special about me. So like I've, uh, uh, looking back over like high school and all that, I was like, I was never really anyone's best friend. Like I had good friends and I was like in different groups and stuff, but I was no one's best friend and I've mm. never been a best man at a wedding or anything like that. And I was like, it's probably because there wasn't anything that really stood out. No real personality. Cause I was just kind of like cookie cutter forming into whatever I thought they wanted. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you have to be distinctive. And if you're out there in the marketplace trying to show your pictures and they look like everyone else's, why would somebody hire you? Exactly. I, I always think, you know, pretend you're a casting director hiring you for a part. What, mm. what, what do you, what's, what's your secret sauce and what's your superpower and all those sorts of things. But I think a lot of photographers tend to stay in the middle and try to play it safe and, you know, want to appeal to everybody. But, uh, in fact, if you say you need how many weddings a year, do you want to shoot 15, 20, mm. 10, you know, you pick your number and you're looking for that many people. And that's yeah. not too, that shouldn't be that hard to find 15 cool people in college station, Texas or wherever. Exactly. <laughs> Instead, a, a lot of photographers kind of want to appeal to everyone on the internet and get everybody to love them. But you're looking for a small number of people and it's even smaller than that. Cause if you find that cool person who has, who's sort of the influence there in their group, you'll get two weddings from each person like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's always the best. Whenever you get an inquiry from someone, they're like, Oh, I was a bridesmaid at this wedding and yeah. it was so much fun. You know, you, you were the life of the party and jumping on the dance floor with us. I want that at my wedding too. It's like, yeah, it's our, they're already sold on you. Like I have to do no selling whatsoever. I don't have to it's much tell more them efficient. About anything. Yeah. Much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Before we get into more imperfection and, and embracing all that, there's, um, uh, some that I've started implementing recently is just some random questions. Cause I feel like, um, like we could, talk about like your accolades and decades of photography and author and speaker, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I really feel like I get to know people by just random questions. So I've Love stolen it. some questions from uh, Stephen Colbert and then added a few of my own. Um, I've got 17 here. We're not going to go through all 17. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> I'm, Let it rip. I'm, yeah. Um, I'm just going to have you, uh, pick two, uh, two numbers between one and 17. Uh, three and 15. Okay. All right. Three. Okay. Um, what is the scariest animal? You know, I saw I, I saw a porcupine on one of my walks recently, and they're beautiful. But you know, they've got some ways to get you. They if really you, do. If they wanted to, they they look like they remind me of hedgehogs, where they're like all <laughs> pokey. But like hedgehogs, yeah. you can pet them, and it kind of feels fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, those porcupines, like they have like the uh, the barbs, 
in all of those yeah. spines. And that is just not for me. Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen one in, uh, in real life. Uh, but yeah, no, that is, that is definitely, I could see, you know, in the middle of a photo shoot, walking backwards with a couple or something and just <laughs> brushing up against that, that would, uh, that would not be fun. Um, okay. And you said 15 for your other, um, yes. Ooh, okay. This one, no one's, no one's picked this number yet. So this is fun. Um, describe the rest of your life in only five words, uh, which I feel like that is probably one of the more difficult questions of these 17. Sitting on my back porch. Sitting Love on it. my back porch. <laughs> yes, that's great. Just <laughs> just relaxing. Do you have like a nice scene up there? Uh, we do, and we're, we're renovating, and uh, oh, cool. we're just putting on a, a new section of our house, and my wife added on a kind of a sleeping porch because growing up I always loved sleeping out on that. So that's going to be my podcast and uh, sleeping porch nice oh that was great there's something special about like sleeping outdoors just like yeah. with that just the open air if you can see the stars above you i love camping and just like with the open uh open like mesh on the ceiling of the tent is just nice. something special about that it's been years since i've been able to do that again but i need to schedule something uh sometime when it's not super it. cold yeah, <laughs> but okay. So John, let's get into, um, it's also fun having another John here. Uh, <laughs> I used to work with, I think there were five Johns at my, <laughs> my, uh, my nine to five job that I had before this. And yeah, it was always, we had to go by last names. Um, but what name yeah, do you what, use at Starbucks or, uh, Kyle actually, <laughs> Not my middle name. I was just like, I, I kind of always liked Kyle. It's got like a Y in there. It's like a hard K sound. And, you know, it's it's easy to be like, oh, Kyle. Yeah, that's my drink. Um, except yeah. I have to remember that I used Kyle. Because <laughs> sometimes I'll just be like, Kyle, are you here? And I'm like, oh, yep. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, yeah. So, like, with imperfection, I know we kind of talked about um uh, being people pleaser and all that but what does looking for um perfection or like how does looking for perfection in your photography affect the way that you photograph i, I think one way to think about it is that um often the perfectly posed the perfectly composed picture feels a little manufactured and often the frame afterwards, the frame mm. between the frame has that reality and that messiness, that slight uh, gesture that wasn't controlled, um, that feels truer. So that was, yeah. you know, when I was starting out, I really figured that uh, I was never going to make that perfect picture. So I leaned into these pictures that felt a little more real. Uh, and then I got a lot of positive feedback from that. So it's just, uh, I, I kind of gave up years ago trying to control the situation. Weddings are too mm. complicated, too busy. And then I also thought that uh, weddings have so much going on emotionally that everything should be part of it. Why are we limi limiting ourselves to just these really sweet, sugary, sweet moments? Yeah. And maybe it's time for wedding photography to expand and broaden to have some melancholy in it, some bittersweet moments, some uh, joy and uh, complexity. A lot of stressed people out there in the world and it's evident at weddings. So oh, yeah. I, I, I include it in my pictures. Yeah. And, and I, I really love that about, about your pictures too, that it doesn't feel like, like you said, like that, like super sweet, lovey dovey, everything, you know, kind of the, uh, um, quintessential like Pinterest type poses where it's just, yeah. it's all dramatic and, you know, full of love and like cinematic and all of that. Um, but like if even, even thinking about, you know, cinematography and, uh, cinema, 
so mm. much of that is not just love, even in love stories, right. you have right. the melancholy, you have, it's like the story arc of the day. And if you're not, not including all of that, then you're not getting the whole day, uh, which I know I I've people, felt. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah I, think, go ahead. I think photographers think that they're going to grow their business by showing totally romantic pictures. And I get mm -hmm. that, but I think that has to come from the couple, not from the photographer. If yes. the couple is feeling it and you capture it, that's great. But if yeah. you're going in with this kind of mission to manufacture romance, that just feels a little creepy to me. It feels a little bogus and, uh, and it just leaves me a little empty. So, uh, yeah. and you can find clients who accept that. That's the other thing. Cause people often say, Oh, if you show this picture, aren't you, you're not going to get as many likes or anything. You're going to find those 10 or 15 people who want that honesty. Yes. Yeah. Cause there are like, I mean, like you said, you're looking for that 10 or 15, however many couples you need to book for that next year. Um, that's who you're looking to connect with. And yeah. instead of like, I want to grow my Instagram to a hundred thousand followers and like have all these people liking my photos, it's, you're not looking for a hundred thousand clients every year. So just focus yeah, on it's, what's it's funny connect. because we we were sold that as a way at the as a path to success and even the idea of seo and increasing oh. your reach and all that stuff i i've turned that on my on its head and um i'm really speaking to people saying this is my value this is what i value i value honesty and authenticity all those words but then i back it up with pictures that feel real and so i don't get i don't get a million inquiries but i get good inquiries so yeah it's a it's not an especially normal you know normal american business model to want to stay small but it's okay if you're in a small town in you know new mexico and you find the cool people at that cool coffee shop and you find those cool brides then you're gonna make great pictures for them Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like the, um, the wedding industry has almost shifted back to, um, I don't know, maybe it's just my circles, but shifted back away from like the glamorous destination flying off to Cabo every other weekend and like finding all these people in all these different locations, which is a lot to do uh, yeah. with SEO and uh, social media and getting your reach out there to find those people. Um, but shifting more away from that and back to find the people that really connect with you and your style and, and what you're putting out there. And if they are all in your hometown, then that's great. Like, yeah. you don't have to travel. You, <laughs> you've got like a 30 minute drive and you're done. Uh, uh, or, or if they do happen to be in, you know, Mexico or Spain or other places, then you can have that. And, uh, and I, I love that kind of recentering to what photography is about, which is like the clients and the motions and, and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm just saying, uh, people should give themselves permission to stay small, stay local, stay pure mm -hmm. and not wish they were doing something else because there's uh, a lot of angst and anxiety that comes with those weddings in Spain and getting there and getting stuck and you know and oh, is yeah. it worth it if it is you'll know it if it's worth it for you and otherwise there's nothing wrong with being in your own region and making just pictures that you love yeah yeah I love that so like kind of speaking of making pictures that you love, what are some ways that people who maybe they're, they've been focusing on those, you know, picturesque moments, the, the perfect posed everything. Um, you know, you mentioned like the, the getting those photos, those moments, like just after the pose, mm -hmm. just between um, the, the in-between portions of the day, what are some ways that people can like focus on the less perfectly posed and more of the, the imperfect and in-between? I would say there's just a basic trick. There aren't a lot of tricks in my bag, but one is to tell people you're done. So, 
you know, you take them out for a five minute portrait session and say, I got it. And then lower your camera, but be ready because Mm -hmm. often as soon as you say you're done, they'll give you something real. Yeah. And then you keep shooting, walking back to the tent. I love these um, short sessions. So I won't do a hour long uh, bridal portrait. I'll do 10 minutes and then I'll say, uh, that was really great. Let's do it again later when I'll grab you when the sun's setting or something like that. And I'll bring them out for five minutes. And that process of them trusting you that you're not going to take them away from their wedding uh, and you're going to be quick and it's going to be fun and fast and, and fluid um, that builds a really beautiful energy with each other. So they, you know, I've often gone up to people and just give them a look and they love to walk away from their wedding because they're kind of stressed and, and right, have a breath. Yeah. It's like I've so been talking you, to everyone and giving so yes. many hugs. I just need a moment. <laughs> and it bond, then you bond together with that uh, sort of exhale as you leave the tent or leave the room. And mm-hmm. So yeah. often, I mean, a, 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 a motto is that uh, often the, the harder I work and the longer I shoot, the worse the pictures get. So it's like, be quick, be ready and, um, take people outside and just, it doesn't matter where it is. You don't have to look for background, just put Mm. people in good light and shoot the picture and don't fuss and then say, got it. Yeah. I love that. Cause like, you know, we, as photographers, we love taking photos. Like I, I can take a couple out for three hours and, be fine. Like I will keep coming up with fun stuff. And, you know, as long as the, the, my creative juices are going, there are definitely sometimes I'm like 30 minutes in. I'm like, I've, I'm sorry. I've got nothing today. I, I don't, but, uh, but like I enjoy f- taking photos. And I think we forget a lot of times that our couples don't always like they're, they're not professional models. They haven't been in front of cameras all the time. So it's, it, might be a little bit weird for them. They might feel a little bit awkward. So that like short little five, 10, yeah. 15 minutes is perfect. Cause they don't have to like put that face on of being yeah. on for an hour. Yeah. If, I, I think it's a great thing to put yourselves in their shoes. And mm-hmm. also if you do the math, say it's an eight hour wedding, even a 10 hour wedding, and you're off with the photographer for an hour, that's, you know, you spent an hour and a half with your hair and makeup people. So yeah. you're spending a quarter of your wedding with your vendors. Yeah. And then the wedding is almost over and you realize I had a great time with the photographer and hair and makeup people. And I talked to <laughs> my best friend for t- seven minutes. So it's, I, I, I think it's, I think photographers need to realize that it's not about you. It's not your wedding and mm-hmm. be creative in a different way. And, um, I, I really constantly think how much can I positively impact this wedding and not negatively impact it. And I've seen photographers at weddings who are just, you know, trying to push people into these, to get to these moments. And if you're pushing, you're not going to get it. Yeah. You have to be, it's a gift and people give you the gift and you catch it. And if you, if you're not ready, then, you know, you dropped it. So be faster next time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I love what you mentioned earlier about like knowing your couple of, yeah. uh, you know, uh, like with the, the romantic photos or the, uh, you know, like a little bit more on the, the sillier side, like laughter and, and all of that, like knowing them and getting to know them and, and being there and listening to yeah. uh, who they are uh, and picking up on those, those uh those keys from them of just like if i'm putting you in these more like uh editorial type romantic poses and you are not liking it like let's yeah. let's pivot from that and not try and force it uh like you were saying because because one they're going to remember how like that's a beautiful photo but like i remember how how weird I felt when John was like, put your hand here and then like turn this way, but then look over your shoulder this way. And like, I just, John would never say any of those words. No, no, no. I mean, I literally (laughs) cannot tell another dude how to stand. It's like, I just can't, the words won't work. But also what you're saying, John, is that 
our job is to be um, readers of body language. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to, to look at a walk into a room and know who's stressed and who's fighting and who's uh, on the edge of uh, breaking down. And you have to tell when people don't want to do what you are saying and, you know, be humble and just uh, accept their energy. And um, I, I just think do no harm. I think all the prompts in the world are not going to get you the, uh, the true picture and um, nothing. I, I often think that the, the pictures that I get that I love, I, there's no way I could have directed people into that picture. It had yeah. to come from them. Yeah. And it feels so much uh, more gratifying to get a picture that came organically rather than, okay, this is the five steps to get this picture every weekend. Right. Yeah. It just feels like a oh, template. Yeah. It, yeah. It does. And that's when like you start feeling very burnt out with weddings because right. it is a template. It's the same thing every weekend. And, uh, and then it's just like, all right, same thing. We're putting a different couple in here. We'll do the same. Right. I've got my list of five poses and we're done. Uh, like you could, you could Photoshop different faces on different brides yeah. and yeah. yeah, that's, that's a warning sign. <laughs> yes. I mean, I have the other guide I have is if your second shooter could have taken that picture, you need to work harder. Mm, mm -hmm. It's if it's that easy that you know person next to you could have gotten that same shot. Um, I, I think that uh, a measure of, to avoid burnout, you have to be uh, filled up more than drained. So when I get a picture that feels amazing to me, feels authentically came from them that fills me up no matter how tired I am from that three day wedding. So oh, yeah. you need to make sure you're making pictures that fill you up. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned like, um, not like forcing them into, into poses and, and the, the best photos are the ones that just organically happen. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking of a wedding from a, a few years ago where, um, the bride's, I think it was her great grandmother. She was very old, very old, very frail, just like sitting in the corner of, they had, you know, a big white tent uh, dancing outside. And she was just sitting in the corner under some lights. And I just like senses, I sensed her, the bride walking over to her. I was like, I'm going to get in a position to where I can get them interacting. And she just walked up and just like from the side, gave her a big kiss right on the forehead. And it happened hmm. to be framed just perfectly. And I was like, see, this is something I couldn't have been like, oh, hey, Lucy, could you go over there, kiss your grandmother yeah. on the forehead? I'm going to yeah. get a picture of y'all real quick. It wouldn't have yeah. looked that way and it wouldn't have looked as organic. And it is one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken and one of her favorite photos from sure. the entire day. And it just happened to be I looked over while I was on the dance floor and like, oh, this. Uh, well, I think it's uh, about those senses you have to yeah. be really open to your spidey senses. And uh -huh. uh, I've started really just stepping back and listening to the wedding and you can hear mm. where the cool table is. You can hear where this kind of quiet conversations going on. And um, I think, you know, photographers work so hard and sometimes it's better to sit down with people, have a drink and, and chat and, and then the pictures come from that interaction. Yeah. Yeah, I I really like that cuz it does feel like um like you know they're they're paying me to be here and yeah. I they're paying me to take photos so I need to be taking photos the entire time and um just giving yourself that permission to sit down and to chat with someone like the wedding yeah. this past week and mother of the bride or mother of the groom talked to me for 15 minutes about storm chasing and how she dated a guy in college who was a storm chaser in Kansas. And I was nice. like, Oh, I've always wanted to go. And she's like, Oh, go follow this guy. He's amazing. We actually did this tour and he took us to these places and we got these photos. And it was just like that connection with her that allowed for better moments later on where she didn't feel that like, Oh, cameras on me. Let me straighten up. It was just, Oh, John's over here. You know, uh, let me, 
you know, I'm just going to keep well, you're, on doing You're a it. human being rather than a vendor or, yes. um, and I think that photographers should be allowed to give themselves that, you know, that ability to be like a guest and mm. enjoy the wedding. And, you know, I hate seeing a photographer who's just working so hard. They're not even smiling. And, uh, right. so, you know, yeah, yeah, I have definitely second shot with some people before that I'm just like, do you enjoy this? <laughs> do, no. You don't seem like you're enjoying this at all. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the thing. And I think that's why like so many, I think the statistic is like photographers close up shop, especially wedding photographers within the first three years, because oh, is that right? yeah, a lot of people don't get past the three year little hump because it, you get overwhelmed or you're, you know, didn't set up, uh, for profit and you're just like digging into the hole and like, I got to book more people That's, to pay for the stuff I'm currently doing. And, uh, and I think and, if you get, if you start out with bad patterns, bad, bad kind of photographic patterns, mm -hmm. then you're, you're sunk because you're just yeah. going to repeat yourself. So it's, it is important right at the beginning to um, be careful who you follow and be, what, uh, what way of shooting you adhere yourself to because you're going to get stuck. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then it's really hard to get out of those ruts because you've already dug them deep and it is yeah. harder to climb out. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I love, I love all of that. Is there um, maybe like another, uh, any other tips you'd have, or maybe like a story or something of how embracing imperfection has uh, just kind of, benefited you over the years? Well, I think, I think once you get your clients or I'll speak for myself that once I started kind of naming this thing and, um, talking about it to people when I meet them and getting them on board with it and attracting that kind of person, hmm. um, then I had a situation of a, a wedding in Brooklyn and it was, you know, summertime, very hot. And I brought everybody out on these steps to do a group picture. And there were all these kind of um, decorative balls on the steps. And just as we were setting up, a little kid knocked one of the balls and all the balls started bouncing down the, 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 the road. Oh, and no. the groom immediately looked over <laughs> to me and he's like, the imperfect shoot, man. Shoot. <laughs> and he got, he was a theater guy and he got that that was a live moment. Yeah. And some people would have freaked out, but I just, I loved his reaction to it was yeah. this is all part of it. There's no right or wrong. You know, the poor kid was embarrassed and it, it was kind of a great scene of balls rolling down the <laughs> right. Avenue in Brooklyn. That's um, great. But I think it's, you know, it's finding people who get you and then um, you get to be their, uh, your, your co-creator with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that, you know, because you had spoken about imperfection and you had, yeah. uh, you, you had, you had talked to them and communicated and it wasn't just, uh, you know, here's my photos. If you like this hire me kind of thing, but really like going through your whole process, he knew because he was like, yeah, I've already talked to John about this. This is exactly what he was talking about. This is amazing. There's, this is imperfection on my wedding day and he's going to get this. This is going to be memorable. And yeah, yeah, I think it's about the passion too. I think they could tell that I had a, something that meant a lot to me. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be imperfection. It just has to be that you have a a distinct quality to you. I mean, yeah. I'm definitely wary about spreading the gospel of imperfection, having a bunch of people just kind of <laughs> apply it like a template. Right. Um, or like is, inorganically this... <laughs> setting up imperfect. Moments. Oh, it's happening. Yeah. yeah it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. So the, I want to, the trend <laughs> of like the uh, intentional camera blur, <laughs> It's yeah. just like, oh, do that again, but let me change this to one fifteenth of a second. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think maybe this is an idea saying make up your own thing that that's that's your thing. That's something that's important to you. And um, please don't ruin the imperfection with just blurry <laughs> pictures. Yes. Also, I mean, there is a difference between blurry and out of focus. 
and I should probably probably do an uh, a Instagram post about it. But for me, a blurry picture, an out of focus picture, is just means you just were in focus and you blew it. Mm-hmm. But a, a, a blurry picture usually comes from my excitement at the moment, where I'm jump, I'm moving too fast to uh, stand still and get the picture because yeah. it's, it was such a magnificent moment. But um, if you're just posting out of focus pictures and calling it imperfect, that's you're ruining it in the fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's not going to mean as much to your clients either. Cause yeah. um, like there was a photo I had seen on your Instagram. I think I uh, like screenshot it for one of my like, Hey, John's going to be on the show. Send us your questions. Um, and it was, is like a, a, a blurry photo or no, yes, a blurry photo of like you, it looked like you like chasing after the couple as they were yeah. walking and it didn't look like, Hey, y'all walk over this way and I'm going to, you know, move my camera. Shake the as camera. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it looked like you just being like, Oh, I'm going to go get this moment and yeah. chasing after them. And that realness that's going to feel like they're going to feel that more in the photos. If, if you're setting something up or not setting that up, if that happens organically versus yeah. y'all move here and I'm going to, I'm going to shake my camera around and get these cool blurry photos for you. Um, yeah, cause keep it they real. might be, yeah, yeah. You want to keep it real. Um, cause they're, those are the ones that are going to mean something to them in 10, 20, 30 years versus once this trend is over, um, that they're just like, okay, well that was very dated for, you know, 2023, 2024. Uh, yeah. That's but, my biggest fear. Yeah. Every, every, every decade there's kind of new cheesiness. <laughs> I don't want the blurry thing to become the new cheese no oh i remember <laughs> my early days so i uh started taking photos of weddings in 2010 and then decided i want to you know create a business in 2013 and i think it was one of my like 2012 to 2014 somewhere in there one of my very early weddings first 10 or so uh, there was a trend of select color or selective color where oh, no. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I felt hard into that. Every wedding, I was like, oh, your your accent color is green? Well, then everything green is going to be green and everything else will be black and white. And I did that so many times. I should probably, I don't know if I should post any of those, uh, like dig them up from old hard drives, but that was something that I spent hours on by hand right. in Photoshop because there was no like quick little you know deal to do that uh back then you should post it but... under um, old cheese <laughs> old yes. smelly cheese yes yeah and it was like looking back even a year later i looked at those and i was like this is so cheesy this is so yeah. bad but i was so excited about it because it was trendy and uh and yeah it's there's there's a, a line that you have to walk because some trends are fun um yeah and and some trends like the like the blurry photo like those authentic blurry moments those are fun those are are something worth shooting um, i'm also yeah, interested it. in making pictures that are timeless so that mm-hmm. hopefully they stand the test of time and yes yeah and yeah when you're when you're shooting for twin <laughs> shooting for t- trends uh they don't typically tend to be timeless um Okay. Well, John, this has been amazing. This has been so, so much fun. I, uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, before we, before we wrap things up, there's a part of the show that I like to do where we talk about what we're loving this week and it can be hmm. literally anything from, you know, a new book, TV show, movie, whatever, or just food, whatever. Um, what are you loving this week? You know, when I'm home, which is, I mean, I travel a lot. So when I'm home, I love to take an afternoon walk and uh, there's a podcast by a, an Irish friend of mine who he passed away a few years back, but it's, it's a podcast where he read James Joyce's Ulysses for the first, oh. I don't know how far he got, maybe 200 pages, but he uh, goes line by line and explains it and gives the history and the context of it. Um, and it's called Rejoice, re colon, J-O-Y-C-E with Frank okay. Delaney. 
And it's just like having the greatest English professor you ever had in your ear while you're walking. And uh, I spend a lot of time in Ireland. So, um, and, and because I knew him, it was, it's a great uh, connection. Uh, so rejoice on podcasts. Okay. That's very cool. I'm going to have to look that up because that would be like a great, just kind of like in the background as you're going through the day uh, yeah. podcast to listen to. Um, yeah. And I'm sure his accent is amazing. Oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. Um, I am, I'm loving a, a, a podcast as well. Uh, kind of similar to that. There's a, um, a podcast called dissect and he, um, dissects, um, full, uh, albums of, you know, different artists, a lot of, nice. a lot of hip hop artists where he'll go through line by line and like, you know, this is the, 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 the double entendre or triple entendre of this line and what this meant. And, you know, this is referencing, uh, this other song from, you know, 20 years ago or something. And it's just Amazing. like really dives into the music. Uh, and there's, uh, he had recently done, uh, one of one of my favorite artists, uh, Childish Gambino, and went through one of his albums, and it was just uh, it was really great. And I I just love uh, I, I I have never been a good writer, but I love good writing, yes. um, especially when it has multiple meanings or or stuff like that. Like right now with Taylor Swift and like all the 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 stuff that she's like releasing that's talking about other things in you know uh from 10 15 years ago i'm just like oh this is insane the lyrics that you're writing uh that just listening to it if you don't know anything you know it's it's not like up in your face but the, yeah. that hidden meaning behind everything is just i i really enjoy that uh so, cool. but yeah, well, cool. Well, yeah, I'll have uh, links for those uh, podcasts for everyone. Uh, Excellent. But, uh, but yeah, also speaking of links, uh, John, where can they, uh, the listeners find you and, and follow along and, and see your work? Uh, John Dolan.com and John Dolan Photog on Instagram. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. I'll have links for that in the show notes as well. Uh, but yeah, well, Appreciate John, it. Thank you for being on the podcast. This was a really fun time. I enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thanks, John.